Well, welcome everyone to a uh, four season webinar series. Like Jamie mentioned, my name is Candace Hart. Uh, I'm a state master gardener specialist for um, Illinois Extension. So I run the master gardener program for the state and I'm located in Bloomington, Illinois. So I'm here in central Illinois, enjoying these cool temperatures like I think the rest of you are. And we are here today to talk about cut flowers. Cut flowers have been a passion of mine um, probably since I was a kid. I went to school for horticulture, did a lot in floral design, uh, and just really enjoyed um, the cut flower floral design aspect of horticulture. So flowers have always been kind of my favorite group of, of plants. So I'm happy to be here today to talk about how to grow your own cut flowers at home on any type of scale. So with any type of gardening site, you've probably heard this in any gardening presentation you've listened to, the first step is to choose your site. So if you're looking at growing cut flowers in your own yard to enjoy, uh, obviously sun requirements are going to be one of your first considerations. So check out your site. Most of the things we're going to talk about today are going to be sun loving plants. So think about a spot that you might put a vegetable garden. That would also be likely a great place to put a cut flower garden. But we're also going to talk about a couple of shade options and some ideas for incorporating those cut flowers into your landscaping as well. So it doesn't necessarily need to be just a designated cut flower garden. So once you've got your light requirements on that site, think about the soil. Okay, so any type of garden, we usually recommend you start with a soil test so that you can know what your pH levels are like, what your soil fertility levels are, just so you have an idea of what you're starting with. It's always a good thing to start with. And then in terms of the type of beds you might put in, it depends what you prefer. So I grow most of my cut flowers in raised beds because for me it's a lot easier. I don't have to weed as often. I can plant things very close together and it's just easier to maintain. Uh, but these are also a great option if maybe your soil is not so great. Okay, So I built my raised beds up and then I brought in uh, just black topsoil, garden soil to fill those with. So if you have soil that's maybe not ideal, you can always think about raised beds going up, filling those with, with new soil that you're bringing in. If you don't want to do that though, you of course can do a traditional just plot uh, of garden in the ground like you would like a vegetable garden. Uh, and this is especially great if you're going to be growing a very large quantity of flowers, if you want very long beds and you want to be able to grow a, a greater quantity, then a ground bed might be uh, a good option for you if you're looking to scale up. Okay. And then I mentioned landscaping. So I tuck in as many cut flowers as I can and foliages into my uh, landscaping. So if you don't have the spot for a designated raised bed or ground bed for cut flowers, more than likely you probably already have some in your landscaping already, but it's also a great place to add in some plants specifically for using as, as cut flowers. Okay. Just like with any other garden, you want to have water available. Okay, You're going to need to water these like you would any other type of plant when we're in drought period. So making sure it's easily accessible to water and it's easily accessible to harvest. Okay, Just like a vegetable garden, things are going to mature quickly and they're going to mature at different stages. So if you're really looking to optimize your, your length of the flower's life as a cut flower, you want to make sure that you're getting out there frequently um, uh, and getting those cut at the right time, just like you would with vegetables. Okay. So here's the, my uh, plot that I have at my current spot here in Bloomington, Illinois. So I moved into this house about almost three, four years ago now. And you can see in the background there, I have a ton of trees. So my whole backyard is essentially shaded with tall maple trees. So I had to get a little bit creative in where I was going to grow those flowers at. And, and this side of the house, this is the west side of the house, had the best sunlight accessibility. So that's where I put those raised beds. So you might have a spot that you want to put your raised beds, but if your light levels aren't right and if the accessibility is not right, it might just not work. So I had to pick the spot that was best for my 
uh, raised bed. So these are four foot by 12 foot uh, raised beds that I grow the majority of my cut flowers in here. And then you can also see in the back left there, I've just got some typical landscape beds along the side of the garage there too. So I have to grow things in the ground as well as things in um, and raised beds. And I, like I said, I love raised beds. It just makes it uh, a lot easier to maintain and, and harvest and 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 work with so just another season I like any other crop I tend to rotate around the different types of of cut flowers that are growing in each bed this year each year one for soil but also more just for me for variety and and moving things around I like to look at uh, different flowers in different spots and see how they see how they do Okay, some more of the, the raised beds there. We're going to talk a little bit about staking. You'll notice there's some poles added into some of these. Some of our crops need some different staking measures, so we'll look at that uh, as well. Okay, so really take a look at your site. Look at what you have in terms of light availability, water availability, and then go from there in terms of what kind of bed you want to, uh, to add in. This is that bed that I mentioned kind of along the garage. You'll notice the photo on the left. This was what I inherited uh, when I moved in. So clearly the previous uh, owners were not gardeners, as you can probably tell. Uh, they didn't have any plants mixed in there. So first step, of course, was to remove that river rock um, because I couldn't plant into that. Uh, remove that river rock, remove the landscape fabric, and then I came in, added compost, got that soil test so that I kind of knew what I was dealing with. And then based on that soil test, I started to add nutrients. So I added compost, I added mulch to so start to improve that soil. And then every year I continually add uh, more and more, mostly perennials in this bed, cut flower perennials, as well as some grasses and some shrubs. So I tend to have a different view of, of landscaping in my garden and if it doesn't have a good purpose as a cut flower or foliage then I'm probably not going to put it in my landscape because I want to have things in there that have dual purpose that they look great in the landscape they're great perennial plants or they're great annual plants but they also serve a purpose for me as being a great cut flower that I can cut and enjoy so in my particular bed here you're not going to find something like a daylily which are beautiful perennial plants of course but as the name implies the flower lasts for a day so it's not a great cut flower so I'm gonna probably put in here more uh, oriental lilies or um, um, stargazer lilies things like that that I can harvest and have more of as a long lasting cut flower so don't be afraid to mix it into your landscaping more than likely you have some of these already like I mentioned the cone flowers the liatris things like that so you may already have some great things mixed in Here's that bed again. So that last picture was kind of the first year after removing all of that rock. And then, like I said, every year after that, I keep kind of continually adding more perennials, more trees, more shrubs, just to give it more color and more cut flower uh, possibilities. Plenty of weeds too, as you, can, as you can notice, but that comes along with the package. Okay, so a little bit more about getting started in cut flowers. Just like with anything, first step is to figure out how you're going to plant those flowers. Okay, are you going to start from seed? You can purchase seed packets online. You can purchase seed packets from garden centers and you can start your own transplants indoors. So in my garage right now I have uh, quite a few trays that I've planted seed in and I'm growing those seed into transplants so that once the weather is warm enough I'm able to plant those out into my raised beds and have a jump start on growth. Some of those though I'm even just going to take the seed packet and direct seed some of those right into the bed. So zinnia for example grow so quickly or uh, marigolds or cosmos they're so easy to grow from seed that I will some years just plant those right out into the beds once the weather's warm enough and not even worry about starting um, transplants. Okay. Or if you don't have a good seed starting spot or you're not interested in that, you of course can purchase plants. So local garden centers will tend to sell some of these varieties that we'll talk about today. Or you can go online and look for some specific cut flower uh, transplant growers or plug producers. A lot of times you'll see those. So you can purchase flats of, of plugs uh, at usually a pretty good rate. 
Just keep in mind though, if you're doing that, you're going to be getting larger quantities. So for example, I grow a lot of lisianthus. I love lisianthus, but it's a very long seed start time. I would have to start them in January and plant them in, in April, and that's just too long for me to try to, to maintain them. So I purchase flats of lisianthus to go in my raised beds. But when I do that, I order probably at minimum 75 of them per tray. So you're looking at quite a few plants. So if you're talking about a small kind of backyard cut flower garden, you probably want to either start your own from seed or see what you can find available at the garden center. Just know that your selection may be a little bit limited if you're just going for uh, what you can find locally. Okay, so once you've figured out how you're going to plant those, once you get them into the ground, you get them into your raised beds, wherever you're growing them, uh, we need to think about support for some of these, like you saw in some of those pictures. The goal with a cut flower is to grow a very straight stem. Okay, that's always the goal, so that we can use it in a vase arrangement, we can use it in any type of arrangement. We want a nice straight and sturdy stem. So some things need support, they need stakes, they need netting, in order to maintain that nice straight stem and stay upright in the the growing process. So that's going to give you a much nicer cut flower. So there's very simple ways to do it. Here we've got some celosia uh, growing here and they've just created a simple network of twine and stakes or dowel rods uh, and they've created a net that way. And what you do is you put this over your planting area when the plants are young so that when they grow up through that netting they're supported from side to side by that netting and that way they're going to stay upright and they're going to end up with a much straighter stem. So these are celosia. I would do this for something like snapdragons. If I was growing snapdragons as a cut flower that are going to get two feet, three feet in height, I'm going to need some type of, of support system and netting to help me maintain those nice straight uh, stems. Now not everything is going to need this. I can do a whole bed of zinnias and not have to worry about it because their stems are strong enough to support themselves. But there's just certain, um, some of those cut flowers that they need that support in order to get that nice straight um, stem. Dahlias are one of those that I grow a lot of and dahlias definitely need some type of support system if you're growing these cut flower varieties. They can get four, uh, maybe even five foot tall when those flower heads are on there. So again, you can do a netting type of system. What I typically do in these raised beds, you can see that post on the corner there. I will just take twine and, and put posts in each corner of the raised bed and I'll essentially just do twine around the outside of the bed at different heights. Uh, and that basically just kind of corrals the plants close enough together that they can support themselves. Uh, tomato cages also work really well um, for this too. Um, so just keep in mind whatever you're planting, uh, keep in mind what the stem height is and how strong the stem is and if you're going to need some support systems because sometimes you're going to need that. Okay. Now we're going to take a look at some of the flowers uh, that I'm going to recommend to you as some good ones to try. So hopefully some of these you'll recognize as things you've already grown in your garden in years past and maybe you just haven't realized that it was a great cut flower. Uh, but we're going to start with annuals. So these would be those plants that you're going to either start from seed uh, inside or you're going to direct seed them into the garden or you're going to purchase transplants. And these plants are only going to flower for that one year and then they're not going to survive the winter. So these are those plants that we need to plant again every year in order to continue to uh, enjoy those. And there's a lot of great annuals that are cut flowers. So starting off here, oh sorry, it looks like some of the names are cut off there, but the handout for today's program will have the list of, of names. Um, starting off here we have zinnias, and zinnias like I mentioned are one that you can direct seed, so you can plant the seed right into the garden, it germinates very quickly, and they're very easy to grow. A lot of color options, they're long lasting cut flowers, they can have some mildew problems in, in your garden, but as a cut flower, excellent choice. If you've never tried uh, a cut flower before, 
zinnias would be a very easy one to start with. Plant some seeds, let it go, and you can get many, many harvests off of it. That's what's great about many of these annuals is that we call them cut and come again type of crop. So I can come through, harvest all my zinnias with uh, good length stems uh, about once a week. And by the time I'm ready to harvest again the next week, I've got a new crop of stems that have, that have come up. So it's not that just simple one cut and you're done. You get many cuts out of them, which is great. Okay, so that's our zinnias. Straw flowers, excellent uh, cut flower. I'll mention as we go through, some of these are great dried flowers, and straw flower is one of those. If you took your hand and kind of rustled the petals on this straw flower, they're basically dry on the plant itself. So if you're one that likes to make crafts and wreaths and dried flower arrangements, straw flower is a great one to grow because you can harvest it, just hang it upside down to dry and it will look almost exactly the same as when you um, harvest it. So that is straw flower. And it, you can have very many color options, a lot of stem length options, okay? Making sure when you're purchasing the, your varieties that you are getting cut flower length. So always check the height of the plant. If it says it's only gonna get six inches tall, that would be more of a bedding plant straw flower, and that wouldn't be your best cut flower option. We're looking for nice, long, straight stems that we can use as cut flowers. Next up we have some celosias. So plume celosia is a great landscape plant, even if you're just having it in the landscape, but it also is a great cut flower that you can harvest. Lots of color options. It also dries very well, like our uh, straw flower that we were looking at. So you have a lot of different color options to choose from. And typically you're going to harvest that main large plume that comes on first and then even after you harvest the center bloom you're going to get side shoots that'll come after that so you get multiple harvests off of it. I also love, maybe even more so, the crested celosias. So these are the ones that kind of have that brain-like appearance to the flower head. They're going to grow the same way as the the plumed celosia. They just have a slightly different flower head uh, to them. It's just something cool to try out. Next up we have Gomfrina or Globe Amaranth. This is a low growing kind of bedding plant that you could also simply add to your landscape, but great cut flower. Kind of like straw flower, if you touch your petals on there, they're basically dry. So you can again cut a bunch of this, hang it upside down to dry, and it will hold its color and look perfectly as it um, as it was if it was fresh. So here you have some orange gomfrina and there are many color options, pinks, purples, whites, just a really explosion of uh, of color on those. Next up are the amaranthus. Um, here we have an upright amaranthus. These are going to need some space. Okay, you're going to get about a four to five foot height on these stems. So these are going to kind of go towards the back of your bed or you need to have an area where you can give them that space to grow. Uh, but these are just wonderful, nice, upright, strong stems uh, as cut flowers that again, you could also dry and enjoy later. So this is kind of a coppery colored orange uh, one. I tend to grow a batch of the copper each summer and then also a batch of the burgundy and you can see some of that peeking up there as well. Okay. You also have uh, hanging amaranthus, or you might hear the common name love lies bleeding if it's the red colored form of this. Also very great to grow. Because it is hanging and pendulous like this, the hanging type you're going to need some type of staking for to keep things uh, upright. But very cool, unusual um, flower that you can grow. Cosmos, like zinnias, would be a great one to start with if you're brand new to cut flowers. You can plant seed very easily out into the garden and it will germinate very quickly and you'll have a lot of foliage, a lot of flowers. Most of them kind of have more of a daisy-like uh, appearance, usually pinks and whites. But here we have one that has more petals to it, triple, doubled petals. So it almost looks more like a, a carnation. So you certainly have variety that you can pick from. Rudbeckias, many of us are familiar with the perennial Rudbeckia or Black-Eyed Susan in our garden, but there are annual Black-Eyed Susans as well, and they tend to have a little bit more color variation. So you can get some different colored centers, a lot of really pretty 
autumn um, colors that you can grow as cut flowers. Oops, sorry, wrong direction. Okay, so there is that typical uh, yellow brown center black eyed Susan but you'll notice with the annual black eyed Susans they're bigger beefier flowers than you're gonna get with the perennial black eyed Susan you might have in your garden already so you're gonna have bigger flowers and a little bit more color variation to to go with okay next up we have sunflowers classic cut flower very easy to plant seed in the garden and enjoy those uh, later on this one here you can see is a very large sunflower so probably not your best option as a cut flower we're looking for kind of thinner stems not as big beefy um, sunflower but i wanted to point out uh, with these, it is very easy to save seed and collect seed from something like this if you let them um, stay in the garden. You can see all that seed that has developed in the center of that flower there. You can collect that seed and plant it again next year and uh, continue to have those. What I try to do with sunflowers typically is have a succession. So I'll start with one crop in the spring and then probably every week or every other week after that, I'll plant another uh, planting of sunflowers. Because like, unlike a lot of the other annuals, when you har if you cut the stem all the way to the ground on a sunflower, you're not gonna get another flush of growth. So if you want continual sunflowers throughout the season, uh, I want to plant that succession so that I'm always having uh, a crop. And you'll notice here, these were, like I said, very large sunflowers. So I was even able to harvest the stems at the end of the season. And I used those uh, to create staking materials and trellis materials. So don't forget about the stems. They can be useful sometimes as well. Okay, next up we're going to take a look at some bulbs or kind of bulb-like uh, storage organs that also make great flowers. So kicking it off with some of the summer bulbs uh, first. So what we call summer bulbs tend to be uh, plants that we plant in the spring. Uh, we enjoy them for the summer, use them as cut flowers, but if we want to plant them again the next year, or if we want them to survive, we need to dig them up, store them inside for the winter, and then replant. So dahlias are one of those that I love growing dahlias. They are a little bit labor intensive, because like I mentioned, they need staking, we need to support them. But then if we want to replant them the next year, at the end of the season, I need to wait till a frost, cut off the foliage, and then dig up those tubers and keep them cool and dry for the winter. And that's where a lot of gardeners struggle is getting those to survive the winter. So if you're able to, or even if you just treat them as an annual and grow them for one season, it's a great uh, crop. A lot of color variation, a lot of flower types uh, to choose from, and just gorgeous, gorgeous flowers uh, to grow. This one's a cafe au lait. That's one of my favorites. It's as big as your face. It's a big dinner plate um, dahlia. It's very popular for weddings. Love to grow that one. Okay, another summer bulb that you can tuck into your garden is gladiolus. This, of course, is a very old-fashioned. This is a corm that you can plant in the ground, uh, and then you'll enjoy this beautiful uh, flower that comes from that. And again, if you want to save them, you can dig them up, store them for the winter, and replant every year. Or occasionally, if you forget or leave them in the ground, if you have a mild enough winter, sometimes they will overwinter for you if you're lucky. Lilies, great cut flower. Most of the lilies are going to be perennials, luckily, so we don't need to necessarily dig up most of our lilies and store those. We can leave them in the ground. Um, but these would be some of the uh, Asiatic lilies, a lot of color variations, but all just great cut flowers that you can enjoy. We're going to talk a little bit about harvest later, but this, these are a great one to show an example of when I would actually cut this lily to harvest would be when these buds are just starting to color up. So these buds here in the back, they're, usually, they're showing that nice pink burgundy color. That's when I would harvest the stem and, and bring it inside and use it as a cut flower. If I waited until the flowers are actually open, you can even see here right here they're going to get the petals are going to get damaged it's not going to last for a very long time once i harvest it so we'll talk a little bit about harvesting but making sure that you're harvesting those at the right stage but lily are one that we want to harvest them fairly early so that we're not damaging the flowers when we go to use them in arrangements or bring them inside okay 
next up we've got some spring bulbs so right now I know in my garden the spring bulbs are are looking great and I've got a crop of tulips in my raised beds that are looking pretty similar to this right now they're they'll be ready to harvest hopefully probably in this next week uh, but I wanted to touch base quickly on tulips because growing tulips as a cut flower is a little bit different than growing tulips as a landscape plant. So I plant these tulips in the raised beds in the fall. So in October I plant a couple hundred usually at least of, of tulip bulbs in those raised beds, plant them at the, the proper depth. But you'll notice I plant them very close together. You wouldn't necessarily do this in the garden. And the reason I can do that is because essentially I'm treating these tulips as an annual. Okay, so when I go to harvest these next week or whenever they're ready, I'm not going to cut the stem at the base. I'm actually going to pull up the entire bulb with it. So I'm going to pull on that stem and it's going to bring the bulb with it. And what that allows me to do is have a much longer stem length, okay, because I have a couple of inches below the soil that I can use as stem length. And it also allows me to store those tulips for a period of time if I needed to. Like if I wasn't ready to use those uh, tulips, I could do that. Okay, and like lilies, I'm gonna harvest them when they're just starting to show some color. So those those buds in the back, they're just showing that orange color. That's when I'm gonna start to harvest. I don't wanna wait till the flowers completely open because again, I've lost some some vase life there. So I'm gonna pull the stems and the bulbs when they're just starting to show that color. And here they are laying in a crate there. And what's nice about leaving the bulb on is that you leave the food source attached. So if I'm not gonna use these these stems for a couple weeks, I can put lay them like this on in a box or a crate, put them in the cooler and they will look exactly the same for several weeks up to months because they have the bulb still uh, attached. Now, tulips are phototropic, so they need to be dark so that they don't bend up towards the light. Uh, but that I just wanted to showcase that because that's different than tulips in your garden. Okay, tulips in your garden, you need to leave the foliage on if you want them to come back the next year. Okay, in this case, we don't, we're treating them as annuals. So I'm gonna replant new tulip bulbs every year in those uh, raised beds. So something a little different there. Okay, next up we've got some perennials. So I'm gonna whiz through some of the common perennials. Again, you might have some of these in your garden already and didn't realize they were great cut flowers. The key with perennials is that you stagger out your flower time. So you wanna have some spring flowering perennials, summer, fall, so that you always have a variety of things to, uh, to harvest. Excuse me, wrong. Very touchy. So what I'm harvesting right now from my garden are hellebores. I love hellebores, one of my favorite perennial plants to put in, mostly because they're a shade garden plant and there's not a lot of great flowers that you can mix into a shade garden. So right now the hellebores are looking spectacular and I can cut the, the stems of those and use those in arrangements and enjoy them as a cut flower. Really great color uh, options, greens, pinks, burgundies. So if you don't have hellebores in your shade garden, I would add some in, okay? Great flowers. Bleeding hearts are gonna be popping up here soon. My foliage is, is popping up, but I don't have any flowers yet. Uh, but once they do, you can harvest the stems of those bleeding hearts. And those are great in arrangements, give kind of that arching um, accent that you can add in there. Okay, soon enough we'll have peonies getting ready as well. I grow as many peonies as I can. I'm always adding more and more peony plants in because they're just beautiful cut flowers. Okay, short season, but when they are ready to harvest, they are beautiful and I can use them, uh, I can use all of them easily in one season. So typically you have white flower colors, pink flower colors, burgundies, but I wanted to note again here the time to harvest. So once my peonies, get to this stage, we call it the marshmallow stage. So you have the bud showing here. They're starting to show some color peeking out of the bud there. What you wanna do is take your hand and give it a little bit of a squeeze, okay? If it feels a little soft, think of a marshmallow, uh, then that's a great time to harvest. If it still feels kind of rock hard, give it a little bit more. But this is the stage that you're gonna harvest peonies. 
Okay, so if you're just using these for your own enjoyment, you would cut them at this stage, strip off that foliage, put them in a vase, and then you'll allow them to open inside so that you can enjoy the full beauty of that peony. The reason, another reason to cut them at this stage is that we can also store them at this stage, similar to what kind of what we did with the tulips. So if I harvest all my peonies at, at this stage, at that marshmallow stage, strip off all the foliage so I have nice bare stems, I can wrap those stems in newspaper, so kind of create a tube of, of newspaper and wrap those stems in there, and I can put them in the cooler. And I can leave those in the cooler for weeks to, to months. Uh, this is called dry packing. And then once I'm ready to use those peonies, let's say later in June or even July, I can bring them out of the cooler or the fridge, uh, recut them, put them in hot water, and they will open up right away. So it might seem like a very short season in May or whenever those peonies become ready, but you can actually dry pack those and store those for a longer period of time, which a lot of people don't realize. Definitely try out peonies. Ladies mantle is a great low growing perennial you can mix into the edge of your bed. It's a great filler flower. Oops, sorry. Uh, iris is another great rhizome that you can add in. A lot of different types of irises that you can mix in. Oops, uh, Liatris and purple coneflower are both great native perennials. You might already have mixed into a native garden. They are both excellent cut flowers. I love purple coneflower. Even when the petals are done, you can pluck off the petals and even just use the centers. They have beautiful orange um, centers and a lot of different flower colors. Okay. Eryngium is another kind of not so common perennial that you can mix in. Makes a great filler flower to add to arrangements. Poppies, beautiful cut flower. Even if you let it go and you harvest the pods, the pods are also uh, very interesting. Again, I'm not going to harvest them when the flower is fully open. I'm going to harvest it when that bud is just starting to crack open and the, the color is starting to, to show. A stilbe is another one you can mix into the shade garden. If you have a nice moist shady site, a stilbe will do great and give you some great cut flowers. Clematis you might not think of much as a cut flower, but these are beautiful in arrangements and bouquets. The challenge is to get a nice long stem. That can be, it kind of depends on the variety, but if you're able to get a long enough stem to, to cut it and enjoy it, even just in a vase by itself, beautiful cut flowers. Clematis are lovely. Yarrow, I'm always adding more yarrow in because this is another one, kind of like an annual, I can cut it and get another flush of flowers typically. So you tend to get more um, harvest off of it. Sorry, wrong direction. Phlox, so later in the summer, once your garden phlox comes up, that's a great cut flower. See them, this guy will last for years, it seems like, in an arrangement. So you can cut them and harvest them when they're just starting to show color, when they're fully showing color. You can even dry them and leave them at that brown stage and enjoy them uh, then as well. It's a very sturdy uh, cut flower. Okay, and then lastly, I want to leave you with some ideas for textures. Okay, that's what really makes your arrangement unique, is to add different textures to your arrangement. So there's definitely foliages, grasses, shrubs that you can mix in as well. Okay, so here we have lamb's ear. Now I know you're probably thinking, oh, that's a thug in my garden. It spreads like crazy, which it can. Um, but if you cut it back frequently and you use it as a foliage in arrangements, you can actually kind of <laughs> keep it in check. So I love to grow lamb's ear. It's a great foliage to use to mix into uh, arrangements. Okay. Even some of the edibles are great. There's some kale here in this photo here, Dusty Miller in the front, and Plectranthus there on the right. So there's a lot of great foliages, annuals that you can uh, mix in. Scented geraniums are make wonderful foliage to mix in for that fragrance. Okay. In your shade garden, you can use that hosta foliage. You can use the Solomon Seal foliage there in the back. It's a great arching shape to it. So don't discount your other shade uh, plants for cut foliages. Even your coral bells. Now these are going to have short stems, so you have to use them kind of in a smaller arrangement. But the color patterns on these are just lovely to mix in um, to an arrangement. And even the flowers. I use the flowers as fillers as well too, so you can kind of get double duty. 
Okay, grasses, excellent for adding texture and just another visual interest to your arrangement. So you've got some miscanthus there in the back. The zebrinus has that striped foliage. You could use the foliage. You could use the seed heads. There's a lot of grasses that you could mix in. Northern sea oats is probably one of my favorite grasses. Again, it can kind of be a thug. It can spread a little bit if you're in the right spot. Um, but man, just those hanging seed heads that wave in the wind. They're just beautiful uh, grass to, to mix in. Beautyberry is probably one of my favorite native shrubs that you can put in, Calicarpa or Beautyberry. You, in the fall, you'll get these just gorgeous purple berries that you can cut uh, and use in arrangements. Now, this time of year, the my bridal wreath spirea is not quite open, but it will be fairly soon, and a lot of the spireas you can cut and, and use in arrangements. Back in the shade garden you can plant Japanese pieris. That's a kind of a unique shade shrub that you can mix in and in the spring it'll have these beautiful bell-shaped flowers that are a great addition. Nine bark is an excellent shrub for foliage. I grow a lot of nine bark wherever I can in sunny areas um, so that I can cut those stems and use them in bouquets, use them in arrangements. It's just a great kind of all-purpose foliage that you can add in. Okay, we're going to finish it off with a little bit of maintenance and harvesting stuff before we look at some questions. So obviously with any type of garden, weeding is going to be important. So making sure you're staying on top of the weeds. Definitely consider mulch if it works for the area that you're growing in. And a lot of larger producers will grow in either the roll black plastic or they'll roll landscape fabric down over the beds and they'll cut holes in that to plant their their plant. So on a larger scale you definitely need to have a weed plan in place. Okay, watering of course is going to be a maintenance task. So carefully monitor your watering. Anytime you can keep the water right where it needs it at the soil level is great. So soaker hoses, drip irrigation is great if, if that works for your site. Okay, and then we didn't, I didn't mention this as we went through, but you can certainly manipulate stem lengths and flower times with some pinching and pruning to alter those stem lengths. So those peonies that we were looking at earlier, you might actually do some disbudding on those early in the season. And what that is, is that you're removing the side buds, so those smaller side buds. You remove those earlier in the year so that all the energy goes into that one really big uh, peony bloom. Okay, that would be disbudding. Okay, you might do pinching. Many of us will pinch, let's say, our chrysanthemums in the the landscape. We pinch those back several times so that we get more flowers on them. Okay, that would be an example of, of pinching. So just some other maintenance tasks you might have to uh, to think about. Here would be some of that drip irrigation. So again, if you're doing a larger scale, you're certainly probably going to want to have some type of water system planned out so that you can easily uh, maintain that. Here's an example. Here's some celosia here that you can see uh, were not pinched. So we have a one very long straight stem and most of the time with a cut flower that's what we're going for, right? We want a long straight stem. Um, you could have also earlier in the year if you pinched these celosia what you would have ended up with would have been more flowers Okay, because it would have branched where, from where you pinched it, but shorter stems. Okay, so you kind of have to weigh your your goals. Do you want very long straight stems, and do you want mostly one kind of really good harvest, or do you want to pinch them earlier in the year and have more branches, more flowers, but shorter stems? So you kind of have to weigh your your goals there. Okay, now to finish it off with harvesting, a very key part of the process here. Like I mentioned as we went through, the stage to harvest really depends on the type of flower. Some things are best to cut right before the blooms are fully developed. Okay, some are best to cut in the bud stage. Some are best to cut at the fully open stage. Okay, so we looked at those lilies earlier. We looked at the peonies. Those are best to cut when those buds, like I said, are just starting to show color. Okay, contrast that to something like um, 
zinnias, for example, I'm typically going to cut my zinnias when they're basically at that fully open stage because I know they're not going to really open much more after I cut them. So a lot of it is trial and error and learning as you go what is the best stage uh, to cut each type of flower. Okay. Now in terms of time of harvesting, you want to harvest your cut flowers when they have the most amount of water in this in the plant and they have the most amount of food, most amount of sugars. So late afternoon is a great time or evening because they've they've gotten the sun all day, they have lots of food stored up, lots of sugars. Um, or if you can't do that, morning is also pretty good as well because they're going to be nice and full of water at that point as well. Okay, so essentially you want to avoid kind of the middle of the day when there's a lot of heat happening, a lot of water loss, and there's not a lot of sugars developed yet. So think about morning or evening in terms of best time to harvest if you can. Now, obviously your cut flowers are not going to die if you harvest them in the middle of the day, but if you want the optimum length life of those cut flowers, that's what you're looking at in terms of timing. Okay, oops, wrong way. You want to cut your stems longer than you're going to need them. So if you have a particular type of arrangement in mind, you're going to cut your stems based on that type of arrangement. You're going to remove any foliage that's going to be in the water. Okay, and then you're going to place those stems in warm water to allow them to uptake water for a couple hours. So typically what I have when I'm harvesting out in the garden is I'll have a bucket of warm water ready to go. I'll harvest a stem, I'll strip off the foliage, I'll just take my hand and run it down the stem, strip off the lower foliage, and then it'll go right into that warm water. So I'll cut, strip foliage in the warm water. Okay, and the reason for that is that anytime you have foliage in the water, you're going to cause bacteria to grow on that foliage, and that's what's going to clog your stems and really sh lengthen or shorten the life of your stems. So give them a nice clean cut, remove foliage that'll be in the bucket in the water, and then place in, in warm water for a couple of hours. Okay, that way it's going to be nice and full of water when you're ready to use it. Okay, always use clean containers, whether that's the bucket you're harvesting into or the vase that you're going to use. We want to keep bacteria anywhere away from these cut flowers. Okay, I mentioned removing any foliage that goes on the water. And then in that water, once you get to that final stage of putting them in a vase or putting them in an arrangement, we want to use a floral preservative. So you can get packets of floral preservative from your local florist or from the grocery store floral section. Most of the time they'd be happy to give it to you. Um, but what it contains is a sugar, acidifier and bactericide. So if you're thinking about a home remedy you might have used in the past as a floral food, think about does it contain at least two of those. Okay, so if it has some sugars to it, if it has some acidifier, great. Okay, so one that I hear pretty commonly is something like a lemon lime soda. Add a splash of lemon lime soda to the water, it'll give you a little bit of sugar, a little bit of acid because it's a citrus uh, drink. Some people will add a splash of Clorox to give that bacteria side in there. Honestly, get a f packet of floral preservative if you can. Like I said, most florists are going to be happy to give it to you and then you can just open that up, dump it into your water and be ready to go. Okay, but in a pinch, if you need to create your own home remedy, think about what it contains. Okay. Once you've got your flowers arranged then, you want to keep them in a cool location away from direct sunlight. Okay, that's going to give you the longest length of life and you're going to change the water frequently. Okay, if you're really on it, swapping out the water every day is great. Every other day, good. Okay, the more you can keep fresh water, keep the bacteria away, the longer your flowers are going to last. Okay, and the longer you can keep them cool and away from sunlight, the longer your flowers are going to last. Okay, and that's always the goal, is just to enjoy those flowers as long as possible. Okay. So with that, we're going to do some questions here. So there's my contact information. I'm always happy to answer any questions related to uh, growing cut flowers. Like I said, it's definitely a passion of mine and something I love to do. Um, you can view past recordings of these webinars on our YouTube channel. So go.illinois.edu slash four seasons recordings and you'll see a long list of great videos that you can watch, especially now during these uh, times. 
And we also have a survey as well that we'd love for you to fill out. So you can use a QR code or go sh code reader or go straight to this website and just give us some feedback on what you might have learned today, other topics you might want to hear about, just so we can make sure we're, we're doing great with these webinars.